Welcome to the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. We're so glad you've taken the time to listen, and we pray this message from our pastors will be a blessing on your life this week. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open to chapter uh, 15 of Acts. We're going to Acts chapter 15 today. We're going to finish 15. We started it last week. We're going to finish 15 and start 16 today. Um, and today is going to be a little bit different. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like this is really a sermon. I, I think this is just a word that I, I want you to hear today. And so we're going to go to the end of chapter 15 and, and read what happens next in Paul's life. And and what I just want to talk to you today about is the the importance of relationships in our lives. I hate that Sue couldn't be here. I would love, you know, I would love to have had her perspective as well as she's been to so many different missions trips that she could she could talk, you know, with with a little bit more um, comparisons of where she's been before. And but I, I guarantee, if you were to talk to her about it, she would say every every trip was very different because the people were different. And just the other day, I was talking to a group. We went to Mexico together once. And we were talking down here, and we were talking about the things that we remembered about that specific trip that took place. And I'll, we'll never forget the people that were around us and, and these special moments. Some of you have served in VBSs throughout your years, and you'll never forget specific years that you served alongside of somebody else. Maybe some of you served in Impact or Royal Rangers, or uh, there was other ministries that you had. Maybe some of you remember, do you remember the tornado? You remember the tornado came through and we all got together and started, uh, we, we had all those meals coming out of this church and we would go out and some of us men were, I didn't have a chainsaw, but some of you men had chainsaws and I dragged the stuff to the, the street. Does anybody remember? Danny, do you remember? Well, I remember at your house, I think that was the first place we went when the tornado came through and there was probably 50 of us that launched upon that place and began to, to clean it up. I mean, how many trees did y'all have down? It was a lot. It was 35 or 40. 35 or 40. And we, I remember just the, the getting together, the working together, the, the manpower that it took to, to try to clean it up as quick as possible. And I'll be honest with you, I hate, I hate tornadoes. I hate that it happened. I, but it's a memory I'll never forget because working together really changes your life. There's something powerful about being arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, sweating together and doing the same, helping one another, helping other people. There's something powerful about it. There's something in that camaraderie that it changes your life. In fact, a lot of people, that's what they struggle with the most is retirement is that they don't have that crew of friends anymore in their life. And in different seasons of our lives, we have different groups of people that come around us and and so that's what we we're going to talk about, just a little bit of relationships in just a moment. But if you have your Bibles open to chapter 15, let's go there. After the council, Paul and Barnabas goes back to Antioch, and they are uh, they're, uh, uh, preaching there in Antioch. They're helping the, the people there. They're telling them about what the decision was made in the council in Jerusalem. There is no need for circumcision any longer. And so they're, they're there. And then Acts chapter 15, verse 36 says this. Sometime later... Paul and Barnabas, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. Now, do y'all remember this? This is back in chapter 11. John and Bar uh, Paul, I'm sorry, back to ch chapter 12. Paul and Barnabas are traveling on their missionary, I'm so sorry, it's chapter 13. If you're, if you're counting, all right? Chapter 13 is what we're talking about. They're on the mission field, and John Mark decides that he's not going to go any further with them on the mission field, and he, they needed his help. And so John Mark leaves in the middle of the ministry, in the middle of the work, in the middle of the job. He leaves and goes back home to Jerusalem. Now they're wanting to go back on another mission trip, and Barnabas, who was Mark's cousin, wants to take Mark again. And Paul, for Paul, his abandonment was all he could take. Let's go back and visit. And Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him. Because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. 
They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, the exact direction they had gone before. He got Mark in the, and, and they went to Cyprus, uh, Barnabas' hometown. But Paul chose Silas and left. Commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, when Paul leaves, he goes north. I think I might have a map of this, but he goes he goes north to Syria and Cilicia. If you'll see, so the, the, the arrow here on the bottom right of the screen, that's where they leave. Uh, they go from Antioch to Cilicia, and then that's where they, they head on that way. Now, Barnabas headed like he'd done before, where he went to Cyprus first. That's where Barnabas went. This is where Paul goes. They go opposite directions to make sure that they don't bump into each other again. That's how sharp the disagreement was. Do you remember who Barnabas was to Paul? Without Barnabas, there is no Paul. Barnabas was the one who found Paul when no one liked him, when no one wanted him. He found Paul, and he encouraged him, and he built him up, and he made him everything that Paul would be. And then, then he found Paul as ministry. And he built Paul up in, in the ministry, and he gave him a place to teach and preach. And all of a sudden, all these things are happening for Paul, and it's because Barnabas wasn't willing to give up on him. And here is Paul and Barnabas. They split ways because Paul can't give the same grace to Mark. And Barnabas refuses to not give Mark another chance. So they separate. Now, I've grown up a long time, and I've, I mean, I've, not a long time, but I've grown up some. <laughs> and I, I feel like I heard my whole life that you should either choose people or your principles, but you can't really allow your principles to get in the way of your relationships. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I didn't actually get taught that. Maybe that's just something I believe. But we see here that Paul and Barnabas, they allow their principles to dictate whether or not they're going forward together. Barnabas is a man of grace. And he has to give another chance to Mark. Paul's already seen what he could be. Mark is discouraged. So Barnabas takes the time to make sure that Mark is going to be built up in the faith, but Paul can't handle it. He's not lowering his standard of his team to bring on this dissenter. And so there's a sharp disagreement between the two of them. They do not see eye to eye, and they split has anybody, have y'all ever read this part of the scripture or heard a sermon on this and just felt so disappointed they couldn't figure it out? Me and Amanda are very different people, and so when I asked her, has she ever thought about this, she said, yes, why couldn't Paul get over himself? <laughs> and I said, are you crazy? He's the head of the group. You don't bring a weak man on a, on a missions trip. That, that guy's full of demons. He's going to ruin the whole thing. You don't take somebody like that with you. Are you crazy? Barnabas is the one who get, should have gave in. Maybe y'all don't wrestle with scripture like that. Anyway, all right. So, um, as I was, as we were just discussing it, trying to, you know, who was right? Who was the right thing? Well, here's what I want to tell you what's right. I'm going to tell you just a second. Verse, chapter 16, let's go. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived whose mother was Jewish and a believer whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, which means that he was, he was well known in the churches. He, he, had, he had influence already. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Okay. Um, we're not starting this ministry here. Okay. <laughs> we do not need to be that intimate for men I would love for us to get close we do not need to get that close okay alright what you know I don't want to go too far into this but I'm just saying like they had just decided that circumcision is unnecessary why would he do this because it was something that he felt that his father should have done and now Paul was taken the father position of Timothy's life. And in so doing, as they went and ministered to Jews, which Timothy was half Jew, remember. 
When he went to minister to Jews, he wanted to prove that he was a circumcision. He was a real Jew. Someone who was willing to do this in adulthood. Why would he do that? I'll tell you why. Because more is expected from leaders. Yes, the Gentiles do not have to do that. But leaders, sometimes, leaders, sometimes you've got to step up. You've got to be a little bit more. You've got to be a little bit higher. If you're going to influence others, there's some things that you're going to have to get rid of. There's some things that you're going to have to leave behind. If you want to influence others, there's some things that you're going to have to forget. And that's just what leadership is. And you can say it's unfair, and it might be. But leaders lead. And sometimes there's more expected of leaders than others. They don't get to lower. They have to be greater. Verse 4, as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders of Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the church, the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Okay, when, when, when Paul left Antioch, he wanted to go preach in Asia, but he was kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching in the Word. When they came to the border of Mysia, which is on the edge of Asia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, including concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So there's four people that I want you to see in this moment, and, and this is what I'm talking about today. When Barnabas decided to take Mark and go into Cyprus, it wasn't long after that Paul decided to go and encourage the people that they had seen before, but he was going to go the opposite direction. He was going to go up into Asia. He wanted to preach in Asia. But God said no. The Holy Spirit said no. The Spirit of Jesus, it says, says no. You, you are not allowed. You cannot preach while you're here. Nobody will listen to you. While you're in this time. Now let me just tell you something. Just because you're going through a difficulty. Just because you might be discouraged. Just because you're not seeing any fruit. Doesn't mean that God's not setting you up for something. God had a plan. He wanted him to go to Philippi. He wanted him to go to Europe. Paul's desire was to preach in Asia. So let me tell you something. Maybe God has shut you down for a season. Because he's got something else he's planning for you. Maybe there's no fruit in your ministry for this season because he's starting to set you up for the next season. Don't get discouraged while nothing has happened. Keep your eyes up and look at what God is leading you to do. When the door opens in the next place, then go to that place. And here's, here's a very important thing. Don't stay in a place where there's no fruit. God wants you to be producing fruit. If there's nothing happening in your ministry, if there's nothing happening where you are, if you're not feeling like you're producing, you're not fulfilling what God's called you to. Well, that doesn't mean you jump around. Don't quit every job every time you get discouraged with it, okay, millennials? <laughs> I mean, at least stay until the benefits kick in, you know? How, how, many, how many of us... Now, how many of us have gotten discouraged but we just think it? We just keep, keep trudging it out. Keep trudging it out. Eventually it's going to get good. Maybe God has shut down that particular moment because he's trying to move you somewhere else. Don't allow yourself. Don't demand yourself. Don't make yourself. Don't move yourself. Keep your eyes up to God and let Him move you where He wants you to. Now, this is what it's just saying here. Is that Paul wanted to preach in Asia and God shut his mouth and said you couldn't preach here. Here's another cool part about this paragraph. It says in verse 9, I'm sorry, verse 10, it says, After Paul had seen the vision, 
We got ready at once to leave for Macedonia. We. This is the first time Luke references himself. Luke writes, we got ready to go to Macedonia. So here's the team. Paul loses Barnabas. He loses Mark. But he gets Silas. Silas is a strong believer that comes from Jerusalem. He gets Timothy in the second city. And then he gets Luke along with him. So here's, here's what I want you to hear today. and Something that I was really blessed by. Thinking, just chewing on the scripture all week. Uh, this past week was General Council down in Orlando, Florida. And while I was there, I got to see several minister friends, um, people who have spoken in my life, people who built me up, people that were there in very, very important times in my life. But I also got to see a couple of friends from college, um, and uh, they, they came from there three or four hours away to come see me and have dinner. And I got to reminisce a little bit about college days and uh, one of them is still single, so we actually got to talk, and the other one has three more boys, so we saw each other um, <laughs> at a distance, pretty much. Um, and then, on, uh, then we also had friends from when we pastored in Anchor. They moved to uh, just north of Orlando, and they came to see us as well. And what I was able to kind of see is the ministry friends, college friends, Friends from ministry, I was, I, as I saw these people, I was just overwhelmed at how many people God's brought in my life to be a blessing to me. But how many of them come and go? I want them to stick around forever. I want them to be my friends. And thank God for phones and texting and messages and Facebook, whatever. But there's nothing like the friends that sit across the table from you. And you're blessed. You are blessed people. If you, can, if you can think of ten people, you could call at any point and they'd be interested in you. <laughs> I was just thinking about how blessed I've been throughout my whole life to have so many people. When I was associate pastor here, I think about how many people sitting here right now that I became close friends with. Deep friends that, that changed my life. So today, I just want to talk to you for just a few moments about the different types of people. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just a few things that God put on my heart. So first of all, there are going to be people in your life that are scaffolding. They're just scaffolding. There are people like Barnabas. Barnabas was scaffolding for Paul. He surrounded him. He protected him. But he also built him up. But it wasn't until Paul and Barnabas split that you could actually see what... Barnabas had built. Those people, they'll have to be removed from your life. The ones that are there to build you up, to be encouragement to you. The ones, maybe, maybe today you still think it that way about Pastor Buddy. Maybe Pastor Buddy was your scaffolding. He was the one that God brought around you to build you up, to become who you are. And then God is now removed. Pastor Buddy, as, as your pastor, as your... But you can see now that you can stand on your own legs because of what God has built. And you see, scaffolding is not supposed to be there the rest of your life. It still hurts when you say goodbye, but scaffolding is not supposed to be there all of your life. Listen, parents, you're meant to be scaffolded. Yes, you're going to be around, but at some point, you've got to remove yourself and let them stand on their own. <coughs> When they're 36 or so, I'm sure. <laughs> at, some, at some point, at some point, you not, not remove yourself out of their life, but you've got to remove yourself so that you can see what you built. If they can't stand on their own, can they stand at all? How many of you can say in your life, let's just testify right quick. How many of you can say in your life that you've had some scaffolding in, in your life? You've had some people that have built you up. And now they're not, they're not quite what they used to be in your life as far as the intensity. But how many of you have been blessed that people have come into your life, built you up, and then when God removed them, you were stronger? Isn't that wonderful? That's what Barnabas was to Paul. There would be some people in your life that are more like Mark. My dad says sandpaper. 
They're people that God will bring in your life to be sandpaper. They are just to rub off those edges. Come on. How many of y'all are removing the sandpaper in your life? Every time that somebody frustrates you, you try to get away from them. Maybe God's trying to work something out in you. Maybe God's bringing in those frustrations, those irritations, those, those nagging people to bother you because you need some things smoothed. And you won't do it on your own. I've had people that are like that in my life. Would you like me to point them out? <laughs> Not here. Sex, 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 sex. Sandpaper. There are people in my life that have rubbed me the wrong way, that have hurt my feelings on purpose. And here's the thing about it. When they hurt me on purpose, I thank God, get them. And God's like, I sent them. <laughs> and I'm like, no, God, you're, I'm the good one. He's like, this is my grace for you, is that you will fix some stuff because you're being pushed the wrong direction. What if we had enough ideas of the providence of God to understand that sometimes God sends difficult things for us? What if we were to realize that that person who's a thorn in your side is exactly who God brought into your life for you to learn that my grace is sufficient, God's grace is sufficient for you? What if that irritating person was actually the messenger from God? So I encourage you, the next time they bother you, just smile and call them sandpaper. <laughs> Thank God, though, that's not all that God brings in our lives. Sometimes he brings us springs, springs of living water, refreshing. Luke is a spring of, of refreshment. Luke is a servant. He only refers to himself in the third person in this, in these words, I mean, in the first person, very small. He says we every once in a while, but he's, he's the guy that's behind the scenes that's helping and encouraging and building up and refreshing Paul every time he needs it. He's smart. He's an intellectual guy. He knows uh, about medicine. He knows how um, the, the culture works and the different places they go. Luke is a wonderful person. How many of you are blessed to say in your life you've had a few springs? People just come around and, and they're just blessings to you. They're just breaths of fresh air. Man. Those people, they bring joy in the room when they come. They bring peace in the room when they come. And, there's, and, and you talk to other people around and they're just like, oh, there they are again. And you're like, how could you hate them? They're the life I live on. Like if it wasn't, anybody know what I'm talking about? Some people, they'll, they'll roll their eyes at them and I'm just like, I don't get it. They're the best things I've ever seen. Because God's given us specific graces for different people. Now, here's another thing about it. You should be somebody's spring. Every single one of you should be somebody's spring. And you might say to yourself, well, I, I'm not very refreshing. Okay, that's a problem. <laughs> Wives, like your job is to be a spring for your husband. You should be refreshed. Oh, man, it's like I did. <laughs> well, let's close right there. <laughs> I don't even know where I was going now. Uh, spring. You should be refreshing. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Everybody should... Be refreshed. Somebody should be refreshed by your presence. I think the point's made. I'm going to go to the next one. Some, you need a soldier. Some of you need a soldier in your life. Now, Silas was a soldier. Silas was someone who could match Paul's prophetic ability, match Paul's teaching ability, match Paul's faith ability. We need people that are the ones who are beside us. Y'all remember the only story about Silas we understand? Anybody... When you think of Silas, what do you think of? Come on. It's okay. It's Sunday school. You can get it wrong. Ten points. Prison. prison. The, only thing, the only story we ever preach about Silas is them in prison at midnight singing worship songs, and all of a sudden an earthquake takes place, and all the doors fly open, right? 
How many of y'all have a Silas in your life, a soldier, someone who doesn't only bring you refreshment, but someone who's there with you in the thick of it, when, in the very worst moment of your life, that they have been there for you. They are your strength. Without them, you don't know how you'd have made it through. Okay? Now, I'm not telling you what has to be marriage-wise, but men, you better be her soldier. You better not leave her side. You better not leave her in the trenches. You better be her strength when she needs somebody the most. What if we all learned to like stop trying to fix everything and just sat in the trench? I'm bad at that. I'm much better standing on the mound and being like, dude, there's no guns out here, man. Come on. Get out of the hole. Let's go. Let's go. But sometimes... We need friends who get down in the trench with us and just sit, be there. I've had, I've had a, I can't tell you how many friends I've had do that. They would crawl down in my trench with me and just sit and say, I'm going to be with you until you're ready to get out. That's right. Soldiers. When I'm in prison, they don't let me go alone. And we're sitting there incarcerated with chains on our arms and hands and feet and Arms, hands, and feet. Wow. And we just start singing worship songs. Right in the middle of my worst moment, we just start singing worship songs. We'll be giving each other strength. It's the power of friendship. It's to give each other strength when you need it the most. And here's the last one. And I think every single one of us in this room needs this. You need a successor. Timothy was Paul's successor. He was his saving grace. Paul has no grace from John Mark. I'm not invested in anybody. That guy abandoned me when I needed somebody in the worst. No. And he gets two cities into his trip. And he finds his boy. And he says, Timothy, I'm going to show you the right way. The last words we get of Paul are him writing to Timothy. Encouraging Timothy as a young minister in the, in the faith. Who's your successor? Who's the person you're pouring into? You might say to yourself, I ain't got myself together yet enough. Paul just abandoned a dude who needed to go into ministry. It's just like, you talking about, what do you mean you ain't got yourself together enough? If you know Jesus, you have enough to give to somebody else. So these are the relationships I think every single one of us need to have. And here's, here's what I really want you to understand, though, is that the only consistent relationship in your entire life is God. The, the only thing that's going to meet you at every single checkpoint of your life is God. The only one who's going to be there for you every time you need somebody is going to be God. I know that's not revelational to you, but... We spend so much time broken hearted about the people who have moved in and out of our lives. But God does that. He brings people in for a season. He brings us Barnabas to build us up and then he removes them to see what has been built. The people that bring you to Christ may not be the one who brings you deeper into Christ. There may be a different group that you have to find. There may be more friends that you have to get around. You may have to be removed from a ministry, and in that you can't give up on ministry altogether. You've got to find a Timothy. Every man over the age of 15, you should be helping somebody you should be leading somebody. You should be encouraging somebody. You should be there for somebody. Every lady over the age of eight, because y'all are emotionally smarter than us before, y'all should have somebody you're influencing. It takes us to 15. It's okay. Every single one of us should have somebody that we're influencing, that we're taking under our wing. And, and that, it's okay if it's just one. Think about the impact you would have if you had just one person that was your person. That you called and texted and, and pressed into and gave everything you had to bless. How many of you know some 
kids that don't have fathers? What if, what if you took the time to try to help fill the void? I know you can't, but I'm just saying. What if you, what if you tried? Timothy lost his father. Paul stepped in. Became the man for him and built Timothy up. Every one of us need to have that person. Now, your children are built in Timothy, sure. But how about outside of your family? Do you, are, you, are you fostering these relationships? Do you have a Barnabas? Do you have someone who's just a little further ahead than you? Do you have a soldier? Someone who will fight along with you? Do you have a spring that will refresh you? Who are these people in your life? Well, let's just take a second and let's thank God for the people we've had in our past. Thank God for the people who come into our life and been these life-giving things for us. And then let us begin to thank God and let us be, make sure that we're becoming that for others. So as we read this section, I just have five things I want us to be meditating on. Five little perspectives that I want us to think on. Worship team, if y'all come on, I, I'm rounding home base. The perspective that wins. God is taking you somewhere... And that you're not there yet. God's taking you somewhere and you're not there yet. It's the law of the journey. Listen, you cannot get to the next stage going the way the, and how you have in the past. You need to understand that you're going somewhere new. Nine weeks ago, Steve understood that he was going somewhere new. He didn't know how he was getting there. He didn't know who was going with him. He didn't know what he needed to get there. But he just knew that he had to go somewhere. He had to go somewhere new. And all that he needed to get there was faith. He trusted that God would bring the resources. He trusted that God would bring the team. He trusted that God would bring the opportunity. They decided to go right when COVID skyrocketed up. How in the world did he know that they weren't going to have to be vaccinated? That wasn't his deal to figure out. His thing to figure out was, I know God's calling me to go on this mission trip and I've got to go. What is God calling you to that you're scared to death to move because you don't know about the resources? You don't know about the team? You don't know what God... I'm telling you, if God's calling you somewhere, he's going to reveal it to you and he's going to give you what you need when you get there. Especially the people that you need. Every season of my life, I've had people step up and be what I needed them to be. And I can look back now, and I can be brokenhearted about the goodbyes that I have said. I can look back, and I can, I can tell you all day long about it. If certain people had to come at a certain time, I don't know that I, I would have made it. But God's been faithful. He always brings who I need when I need it most. He always brings me where I need to be when I need it most. God will give you exactly what you need when you need it. You may not know that you need it a second before, or you might know years before what you need, and God will bring it the moment you need it most. Do you trust Him enough? Have you put your faith in God to know that when you're going through life, He's going to bring the right person, the right resources at the right time? Do you trust Him? The third one is people and principles are worth fighting for. Pray for discernment and choose wisely. This is a hard one. This is one I want you to chew on. When is a principle worth saying goodbye to a person. Paul and Barnabas, their principal, Paul, Barnabas said, I'm going to stick with John Mark, and Paul said, I'm going to abandon John Mark. And those principles separated these good friends. This powerhouse ministry separated. But what did God do? Now what was one team became two teams. Now it was just getting two people into ministry. Now there's six people in ministry. Now they're going opposite directions. And now Barnabas is going uh, to Cyprus and then he's going to go up into Asia. As Paul goes into Asia, God calls him not to go to Asia, but to go to Europe and bring the ministry to Philippi for the first time. And if it hadn't been for this separation, they wouldn't have gone where God was calling them to go. God set into place this disagreement so that he could set them apart 
to do what he was willing to do. Something that may feel like the biggest discouragement in your life is a setup for what God's trying to do down the road. Can we begin to be mature enough to realize that when things we don't like happen, let's be mature enough to be like, maybe God's got a different plan. Maybe God's setting something else up. I was talking to one of my friends. He goes to a real big church down in Florida. And during the COVID time, he was really struggling. They were shutting down and masking and all that. They were struggling whether or not he'd go back. And he was getting ready to tell the pastor he was leaving. When they came back to service, about three months in, there was a Sunday service where they had a, after worship, they did like a choreographed dance on stage. And uh, I think it was to a police song. I don't know. Um, maybe every breath or something. I don't know what it was. But it was, a, it was a secular song that they were doing. And he was so uncomfortable. He was bothered. And he was just like, I cannot believe. I cannot. And he was starting to look around. He saw people popping up and walking out because they were offended. And he was like, Man, this doesn't honor God. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said, Hey, maybe this isn't for you. Can you see the maturity in that? Maybe the next time you're offended by something, maybe you should just whisper to yourself, Ah, this isn't for me. This isn't about me. The next time they sing a song that's offensive, how about you just say to yourself, Oh, oh, oh this ain't about me. The next time I bring up something in a sermon that you don't like the illustration, what if we just sort of say, oh, oh, this ain't about me. One time I, I was leading worship years ago, and I think it was the last time Pastor Buddy let me lead worship in the first service. Uh, I was leading worship, and I was feeling the Holy Spirit, and I looked over at Greg, and I was like, just, you know, it was Mr. Earl playing that morning, and I was like, no, 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 just a second, just a second. And I, was, I just felt my heart. You are so beautiful to me. Anybody remember that Sunday? Pastor Buddy does, okay? Don't go play it, please. I'll be, in the, I'll be in the groove and I can't stop. And Pastor Buddy, like, busted out laughing. Like, I mean, I was in the spirit, y'all. I was in the seventh heaven. And Pastor Buddy just went, Bruh! like, behind me. And it was like, all right. Da -da 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 -da. You know, it was over, right? <laughs> And I realized now that that was for me, and I should have done that in my prayer time, right? Loud and clear. But what, what if there are things that happen in service that make you uncomfortable? What if you just said to yourself, maybe it's not for me. Maybe what somebody else is doing that I don't like, maybe I don't have to have an opinion on it. No? Okay. Well, the three of you, let's just do that together, okay? Hallelujah. All right. One, one, two more. Leadership requires us to be above approach. If you want to have influence on others, you have to understand you're giving up some form of freedom. Because that's what leaders do. And the last one. Difficulty does not mean defeat. Destiny is found in right times, at the right place, with the right people doing the right thing. And what I can tell you is this. <laughs> If you'll be obedient, if you'll be ready when God calls you, He'll bring the right people at the right time to do the right thing in the right way. But you can't pick your own team. You've got to let God pick it. The day that I was uh, helping out at the, the tornado, there was somebody that I was, as he was cutting, I was pulling the branches. And for maybe two years, we hadn't said a word to each other. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, they wouldn't talk to me. And I'll never forget working arm in arm together. I would have chosen that partner. But God had. And it was healing for me to be able to work together side by side. When I was in high school, I had a worship team that we used to travel some and do some music. Trey, Travis, and John Taylor. And what a blessing they were in my life. And that was people that God had brought in for a season. That we're still good friends, but we're not best friends. I mean, we're not the ones that are always with each other. When I was here last time, Marky and Justin Jackson, we did a small group of, uh, of uh, um, financial peace. Ronald Kelleher and Justin, and there's one more that I'm forgetting for some reason. Anyway, we did that together. I'll never forget. 
going together. You don't know what persons that God has brought around you for this season. Be faithful. Who's on your team? Who's on your team? Who's the people that are around you that are going to keep you going straight when you need help moving forward? If you know who they are, that's great. If you don't, begin to pray that God would reveal them. And the last thought I want to say is when you find out who your team is, become selfless enough to care about the name on the front of the jersey, not on the back. What's on the back of your jersey represents your name. Forget that for a little bit and begin to care about what's on the front. When you're out there and somebody cuts you off in traffic, remember that you represent Jesus Christ. Care about the name on the front, not on the one on the back. You say, I'm my own person. I'm an American. Whatever. Okay, well, forget that because you put that on the back burner to be a Christ follower. Let's be the people that begin to represent the family, the body of God in this world. Let us be Jesus' hands and feet here. And let's build up one another. As the church continues to build, let us build. Would you stand with me this morning? Thank you for joining the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. For more information on our ministry, please visit our website at askevilleassembly.com.